Did you know that certain micronutrients and correctly dosed exercise can significantly delay biological aging and improve our health span? Well, today I'll be discussing how vitamin D, magnesium, and the right amount of exercise can influence aging. These three factors have all been shown to have a huge impact on our overall health and chances of achieving optimal longevity. So let's get started with vitamin D. Now, vitamin D isn't just a vitamin. In its active form in our bodies, it functions as a steroid hormone, where it significantly influences the genetic expression of factors related to aging and health. And an optimal level of vitamin D for most of us to be thriving is somewhere between 40 and 80 nanograms per milliliter in our blood. However, more than 70% of the population falls way below this threshold. And this is due to things like decreased sunlight exposure. Most of us simply aren't getting outside enough. An increased use of sunscreen, which blocks the production of natural D3. And those of us with colored skin living in areas outside of our ancestral homelands. And we're simply unable to naturally produce enough D3 in response to the sunlight we get in those climates. Now, if you can't get enough sunlight exposure year round to achieve these optimal levels of vitamin D, you might want to look into supplementing vitamin D3 in addition with vitamin K2 and magnesium, as these three compounds work in synergy together. So I would advise getting tested as a minimum twice a year, once in the summer, once in the winter, to see where your vitamin D levels lie. And if they are too low, then trying supplementing with vitamin D3 at a range between 2,000 and 8,000 IUs a day is probably enough for most of us to bring us up into that range. But if you are doing that, making sure to get tested at more frequent intervals so you can make sure the dose that you're taking is suitable for you and is not bringing you too high or too low. And obviously all this under the guidance of your primary physician. Now, as I mentioned, there is a synergy between vitamin D3, magnesium and K2. And research has shown that these two compounds, magnesium and K2, are both really important to ensure optimum vitamin D3 bioavailability. In fact, if you're magnesium deficient, you might need up to 146% more vitamin D3 to achieve the same levels. And similarly, vitamin K2 helps in us being able to utilize vitamin D3 more efficiently, meaning that the dose we need to take is less and it works more effectively in our body. Actually, K2 also works to help decrease calcium deposits in our arteries. And this can be a problem if you take too high of a vitamin D3 dose. What K2 does is it instead signals for the calcium to get stored in our bones where we need it most and not on the inside of our arterial walls where it contributes to heart disease. And optimizing our vitamin D levels has also been linked to decreasing markers of epigenetic aging. This shows that vitamin D has the potential to slow down aging as a whole. And optimized vitamin D levels have also been linked to a reduced risk of mortality, of death by any cause. In fact, the optimal levels of vitamin D have been linked to a four times reduced risk of death by any cause. This just underlines the importance of vitamin D3 in our overall health and well-being. And so moving on to the importance now of magnesium. Magnesium is a crucial mineral that's also lacking often in our diets. In fact, about half the American population is deficient in this crucial mineral. And this leads to things like increased risk for DNA damage, cancer, and decreased mortality. And this is because magnesium is a cofactor for more than 300 enzymatic processes, including things like DNA repair and energy production. And this is a really important function. And what it means is that when magnesium levels are low, our DNA repair enzymes don't work as well as they should do, meaning that errors in our DNA build up over time. And this contributes to mutations and mutations in our DNA are what contributes to an increased risk of cancer. And therefore you can see why achieving optimum magnesium levels is so important for ensuring the integrity of our DNA 
and optimal health. And there are many studies showing that an adequate level of magnesium is associated with a decreased risk of cancer and decreased risk of death by any cause. In fact, men who have an optimal level of magnesium have a 40% reduced risk of mortality and a 50% reduced risk of death by cancer. And these benefits decrease per every 100 milligrams of magnesium in the diet. Now, in terms of where to get that magnesium from, dietary sources will be best. You're looking at things like the dark leafy greens to get this dietary magnesium. However, if you're looking for a supplemental form, things like magnesium glycinate, l 3 and 8 malate, and even citrate as a cheap alternative are all good options. They have differing bioavailabilities and people tolerate them differently. Some have greater gastrointestinal distress. It's about finding what works well for you. And for men, it seems like an ideal dose is normally 400 milligrams a day, whilst for women, it's typically between 300 and 350 milligrams a day. However, if you're sweating a lot through exercise, sauna or general activity, you might need to increase that by about 10 to 20 percent as a fair amount of magnesium is lost in our sweat. And lastly, we're coming on to exercise, which is another key driver of our aging and longevity. Now, vigorous exercise between 70 to 90 percent of our heart rate max is great for optimizing our VO2 max, improving our cardio respiratory fitness and for optimizing mitochondrial biogenesis. It has a huge impact on our longevity. However, it's important that we don't overdo it. And this is because too much vigorous exercise could actually backfire. Now, some research has suggested that going excessive on the vigorous exercise can lead to some negative health outcomes. Things like increased risk for atrial fibrillation, for example. Now, most research seems to suggest that about 75 minutes a week of the vigorous exercise is where we can achieve optimum benefits. But going too far beyond this and we see those benefits start to reduce and even then it becomes counterproductive. So 75 minutes a week is a good dose to aim for. Now moderate intensity exercise on the other hand seems to be able to be done without any negative repercussions. Up to a certain point the more you do the better the impact on health and longevity and beyond that it seems there's no negative impacts at all. We're talking about things like brisk walking, slower steady speed, biking, yoga even, or swimming. These are all examples of what you'd call moderate intensity exercise. And most studies seem to suggest that in general, sustaining an increased level of moderate intensity exercise has a better impact on our overall mortality than the higher intensity exercise. Aiming for a minimum of 150 minutes a week is a great dose for that moderate intensity exercise. And one really key measure associated to both the intense and the moderate aerobic exercise is our VO2 max. This is a measurement that has strongly been correlated with our longevity and improvements in VO2 max are linked with an increase in life expectancy. And our VO2 max is a really good measure of our cardiorespiratory fitness. And there was a 2018 JAMA study which suggested there was no upper limits to the benefits of moderate cardiorespiratory fitness. And if you're looking to improve your VO2 max, potentially to extend your longevity too, there's a couple of components that you'd want to consider. Firstly is your aerobic capacity. This is because our VO2 max is a measure of our total performance and our ability to perform aerobically is a huge part of that. Now aerobically means with oxygen. So this is all about training at levels where you're not training anaerobically, meaning without oxygen. Now a good way to do this is with what's known as zone two training. That's training at between 60 to 70% of your heart rate maximum. A good example can be brisk walking for sustained periods of time, maybe 150 to 300 minutes a week at this level split throughout the week. This gives us a greater capacity to train at slightly higher aerobic thresholds, meaning that our overall functional capacity is improved too. And the second way is to focus on those higher levels too. So you've improved your aerobic capacity, but you want to improve your anaerobic capacity too. 
This can be through things like high intensity interval training, which can be done in a range of styles. From as simple as short 10 second bursts of all out maximum activity, followed by longer rest periods, up to longer ones too. And a really good way to improve your VO2 max with high intensity interval training is what's known as the Norwegian 4x4 protocol. This is best done on a stationary bike and involves a period of four minutes going at the max that you can for that period of time in a sustained effort, followed by a four minute complete rest and then repeating this four times over. This is really effective because you're training for a substantial period of time for the four minutes. It enables your heart and your entire cardiorespiratory system to get pushed to the max, which is what you want to be doing in order to push your VO2 max up to the next level. And next up is strength training, which is key for ensuring we maintain our muscle mass, strength, bone density, and function as we age. But again, it's key to ensure that we do it in moderation. And research has suggested that between 30 and 60 minutes a week is the optimum dosing for strength training. And ideally split into two different workout days. Anything more than 60 minutes is likely to give you less gains and much more than this, the result is likely to be counterproductive. And last up is just walking, which is another really underestimated activity, which is unfortunate because research has shown that simply increasing our steps per day by a thousand can help reduce our risk of chronic disease and mortality by 10%. Most research suggests that between seven and 12,000 steps per day is gonna give us those optimum benefits. But it has been shown that the benefits keep increasing all the way up to 20,000 steps a day. So it's a case of if you can do more, great, you're likely to receive more benefits from it too. So just to recap some of those optimal exercise doses, on a weekly basis to achieve a good balanced exercise regime, you should be aiming for 75 minutes of vigorous intense exercise, but not too much more than this. A minimum of 150 minutes of moderate intensity exercise, though you can do more if you wanted to, it does seem the sky is the limit. And this could include anywhere up to 20,000 steps per day, any more than 20,000, you're not going to have a risk. It's just that's probably where the benefits will stop. And then 40 minutes of strength training a week split into two sessions on non-consecutive days. And to wrap it up, you can see that each of those components, vitamin D, magnesium and properly dosed exercise, each provides unique and pivotal benefits to helping us achieve optimum physiological health. And combined, they work synergistically and they can help us decrease our rate of aging and optimize our longevity. If you found this video useful, please give us a thumbs up and subscribe below. We release daily videos on health and well-being optimization.